So welcome to Matthew 25. Um, we have spent the previous two weeks looking at this chapter, and today is our third week in it. And like I said, I'm hoping we'll conclude this chapter tonight. So before we go into the verses of um, this evening, I wanted to remind us some of what we have looked at because this chapter is quite long. So we started Matthew 25 by looking at the parable of the 10 virgins. And um, we explained that a lot of the times that parable has um, been misrepresented in a way. Um, and we learned that when we are talking about the five foolish virgins, we are not talking about believers, but we are talking about people who have an appearance of being believers, but actually are not believers. And when Christ Jesus, our savior returns, the people who were classed as the five foolish virgins are those who will be excluded from his kingdom. And so we see that the critical element that they're lacking is that they were never born again. They were externally religious. They were going through religious activities. They were doing everything that externally speaking um, would reveal somebody to be a follower of Jesus, yet they lacked that internal work that can only come from the Holy Spirit. And so we learned uh, one particular thing when we're looking at that parable, that as believers in every timeline, in every age, we ought to be asking ourselves that question, you know, am I born again? Have I given my life to Christ and been transformed on the inside by the power of his Holy Spirit? Or am I merely going through religious motions, you know, with, without actually ever having a relationship with God? If you don't have a relationship with God, you know, this is an invitation for you to give your life to Christ. Going to church doesn't qualify anybody for the kingdom of heaven. Doing good things or doing things that are considered to be Christianly does not qualify anybody for the kingdom of heaven. The only thing that is going to qualify us for the kingdom of heaven is being born again, being born again and having the spirit of the Lord Jesus inside of us, the spirit that enables us to be called the sons or daughters of the most high God. So last week, we looked at the parable of the talents. Um, and, and in that parable, it's no longer about, um, you know, whether you've given your life to Christ or not, but it's about your fruitfulness as a, as a child of God. Is there any spiritual fruit that is emanating from your life? Um, you say you're a child of God, but when the Lord comes back, when the Lord Jesus comes at the second coming, Will he find that you put to use the giftings, the talents and the callings that he gave you? We learned last week that the Lord is expecting a return on his investment. Uh, however, in the economy of God, things are viewed differently from how we view things um, on a human earthly level. Um, so we cannot measure our fruitfulness by the world standards, you know, of maybe how many followers you have, how popular you are, how visible you are, or your appearance, none of those things are going to matter. But what will matter to the almighty God is whether what he asked us to do, did we do it? Did we fulfill to the letter that divine instructions that we were given? And so we, we concluded last week that our mantra would be 1 Peter 4.10, which the Bible says, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. We acknowledged last week that each and every one of us has a gift. Nobody exists on this planet Earth who doesn't have a gift. We all have a gift. And our responsibility is to administer that gift you know, by the grace of God in a way that it will be useful and it will bring forth a harvest. So having said that, um, we will now move on to the verses um, for tonight. And tonight we're going to be starting from verse 31 of Matthew 25. Um, from verse 31 here, we'll be discussing about the judgments, the judgments that are to come. Um, and one thing, again, as we are, we are reading about this, as we're discussing it, again, I'm asking you all um, to let the Holy Spirit minister through you. Um, if there's anything that the Holy Spirit underlines for you, please feel free 
you know, to make it known, share with the rest of us and, and let us all get the most that we can get from the study. So if you are able to look at the screen or you have your, your Bible with you, let's look at Matthew 25 and we're reading from verse 31. I will be reading from the Amplified Version. And it says the judgment. But when the Son of God comes in his glory and majesty and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him for judgment, and he will separate them from one another, as a shepherd separates his sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right hand. And the Amplified explains to us here that the right hand is the place of honor. And the goats, he will put them on his left, which is the place of rejection. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you blessed of my father, you favored of God, appointed to eternal salvation. Come, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me with help and ministering care. I was in prison and you came to me, ignoring personal danger. Verse 37, then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty? and give you something to drink? And when did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, to the extent that you did it for one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it for me. Then he will say to those on his left, leave me, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels, the demons. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me with help and ministering care. May God bless the reading of his word. So we see here in this um, verses that we have read that this is referring to the second coming of our Lord Jesus. You can see it here in verse 31. But when the son of man comes in his glory and majesty and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. And we'll come back to this in a short while. But at the moment, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God the Father. So he's not sitting on his own throne as yet. He is sitting at the right hand of the throne of God the Father. This verse 31 is referring to his second coming when he will come and sit on his own throne. And once he sits on that throne, he will be sitting as judge of the nations and whatever has happened in the nations up and until his second coming. In that judgment, he will be separating the nations according to whether they are sheep nations or they are goat nations. And we'll come back to the meaning of the sheep and the goats um, as we continue with our slides. And we see here that the sheep are able to enter into the place of honor and are accepted in the kingdom of the Messiah as he sits on his throne here on earth. The goats are rejected. And the reason why the sheep are accepted into the kingdom and they inherit the kingdom, one of the reasons is that the Bible says they ministered to the Lord. They ministered to the Lord by ministering to the brethren of the Lord. When the brethren of the Lord were hungry, they fed them. When the brethren of the Lord were thirsty, they gave them something to drink. When the brethren of the Lord 
were strangers, were asylum seekers, were refugees, were immigrants. They invited them in. When they needed clothing, they supplied the clothing. When they were sick, they visited the sick. They ministered to people in prison. They did all this. At the time when they were doing this, they thought they were just doing it to individuals, but they didn't realize that ultimately they were doing it to Christ because they were ministering to his brethren. They were ministering to people who are related to the Lord Jesus. And we see here that clearly the righteous had not done these good works to get commendation from the Lord. They were doing it without even realizing that the Lord was in the business that they were involving themselves in. They didn't realize this. And of course, the goat nations, when they were not rendering help, they didn't realize that actually by not rendering help, they were in fact rejecting the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And for that reason, they were judged. And the Bible says in verse 44 of Matthew 25, that the people who are considered to be the goats who don't re, who don't inherit um, the kingdom of heaven, it says they also in turn will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or as a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then the Lord will reply to them, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, to the extent that you did not do it for one of the least of these, my followers, you did not do it for me. So the Lord Jesus here is being very clear, even for us right now who are hearing this message. When we refuse to help the followers of Jesus Christ, when we refuse to support, when we refuse to help, we are not just rejecting the humans, but we are literally refusing the Lord. After all, believers are the body of Christ. It is the body of Christ that you are refusing to help. When the Bible says to the extent that you did not do it for one of the least of my followers, you've done it to Jesus. And so that tells you, even in terms of hierarchies within the body of Christ, there really isn't any hierarchy because even the people that you might consider to be the least in the body of Christ, to be the least in Christian dom, those very people are holding an eminent position in the eyes of Christ because they are a part of his body. And so that in a way negates the notion that there are hierarchies in the kingdom of heaven. There are no hierarchies because to whatever you did to whoever you thought was the least, in our times, many people are very good at helping people that they think they are going to be able to benefit something out of them. They are very good at giving if they think that gift or that so-called seed is going to open opportunities or give them specific privileges, then they are happy to give. Usually some people in Christian dom even today don't want to help people unless they think they're going to get something in return. But the Lord is saying, if we refuse to do it to even one of the least of his followers, we have done it to him. And then listen to the judgment in verse 46. It says, then these unbelieving people will go away into eternal and ending punishment. But those who are righteous and in right standing with God will go by his remarkable grace into eternal unending life. And once again, you know, talking about the end time and the judgments that are to come, we know we'll continue to discuss this in the weeks to come. But one thing that we realize is that once Jesus comes back at the second coming, that judgment is very crucial because the outcome of that judgment for the people who are alive at that time will mean either of two things. It's either they are going into eternal life, into eternity, into the kingdom of the Lord, never to die and to live a life that is full of the blessing and the justice and the wisdom and the glory of God. But those who are going to be judged as unbelieving people, they will be going into eternal and ending punishment. And this is a key phrase. It's not about that you know, the punishment will be time limited or any such thing. This is an eternal and ending punishment. You know, the life we live on planet Earth cannot be compared to 
the life that is going to come in eternity. So what we have here on earth is an opportunity for us to receive the grace of God, the mercy of God, and position ourselves as children of the most high God so that when the day of judgment comes, we will not find ourselves going into eternal and ending punishment. So as, as believers in Christ Jesus, as the body of Christ, it is obvious from the passage we have read that we are expected to have a ministry of compassion. We are expected to have um, ministerial outreaches where we involve ourselves. If you're not involved practically, you know, you involve the money that God has given you. You invest, you send money to the hungry, you feed the hungry. You show compassion for strangers. You know, we live in, in, a, in, a, in a world that is quickly becoming a global village. But however, in as much as now people are able to travel, you know, and um, relocate, emigrate, go to different places in the planet, we still find that for a lot of people, the experience of emigration, the experience of being an immigrant is not always a palatable experience. A lot of people, once they move to a foreign country, they are faced with a lot of difficulties, you know, in the context of, for example, in the context of the United Kingdom, we know how many people in this country, you know, are subject to, um, UK border agency restrictions where they're not allowed to work, they have no recourse to public funds, they cannot get, you know, the usual processes that people can live off, they cannot get money, they, they don't get enough, they are hungry, sometimes they are homeless, and beyond that, sometimes they are rejected and, and treated as second-class citizens. The Lord expects us to have compassion for strangers. The Lord is not expecting you as a believer to only be focused on your own people or the people who look like you, the people who sound like you, the people who speak your language. The Lord expects us to have compassion for strangers. We are expected as Christians to have a ministry of helps, whether that's providing clothing or food to the poor, ministering to the sick, encouraging the sick and visiting those who are in prison. All these are essential ministries for the body of Christ. Now, coming back to this passage in Matthew 25, there is a deeper meaning to the parable of the sheep and the goats, more than just the demonstration of compassion. So again, remember, we've just mentioned that there is a very real judgment that will transpire at the second coming of the Lord. It's, it's not just... Um, a metaphor. It's not a metaphor. There's going to be a real judgment there. In fact, there are several judgments that are going to take place in the future. Um, and this is one of the judgments that will be there for those who remain alive at the return of Christ. Now, the people we've discussed before about the rupture, the people who would have already been ruptured at this point, when they get to heaven, they will face um, the judgment seat of Christ, the beamer seat, the judgment seat of Christ. And that judgment is about rewards, about, you know, receiving rewards for the things that we did when we we're on the earth, what we did for the Lord. But this judgment we're talking about here is different from that judgment. It's for people who were not ruptured. So these are the people who are coming out of the great tribulation. These are the people who are coming out of the great tribulation. And this is a judgment that's literally separating who is a child of God and who is not, who are the sheep and who are the goats. Um, when you go through the Bible teaching, you will see that we are informed that the Lord Jesus is going to judge both the living and the dead. Both the living and the dead, they are subject to judgment. And it is the Lord Jesus who's going to be the judge of that. If we go to 1 Peter, 1 Peter um, chapter 4, verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 5. I'm reading it in the New Living Translation. The Bible says, but remember that they will have to face God who stands ready to judge everyone, both the living and the dead. You know, whatever anybody is doing on earth, they must remember one thing, that judgment day is coming. And this judgment day is not about what um, we human beings think or what we believe is fair or the right thing to do. It's going to be the judgment that is carried out by the Lord Jesus based on the principles of God and what the laws that God has put in place. 
Paul informs Timothy that this judgment will occur at the, at the appearing of our Lord Jesus and at the appearing of his kingdom. I mentioned before that the Lord Jesus right now is sitting at the right hand of God the Father. So he's not sitting on his own throne yet. He's sitting at the right hand of the throne of the Father. But when he comes at the second coming, he's going to be coming in his uh, power as the king. He'll be taking his throne here on earth. And from that throne, he's going to be judging. If we go to 2 Timothy 4.1, um, if we read it again, I'm reading to you in the New Living Translation. The Bible says, I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom, preach the word of God, be prepared, whether the time is favorable or not, patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. Why was Timothy being encouraged to preach the word of God to be instant in and out of season? The reason was because Christ is going to come and judge both the living and the dead when he sets up his kingdom. When will he set up his kingdom? When he comes at the second coming. And remember, we have said consistently in the past weeks, the second coming that we're referring to is not the same as the rapture. Again, when we look at Matthew 25, 31 that we just read earlier, Bible says when the son of man comes in his glory at his appearing, then he will sit on the throne of his glory at his kingdom. So Jesus has a throne that is going to come and claim here on earth, which is the throne of his father, David. If we read um, the, the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation, we, we hear the Lord speaking to the church in Laodicea. And he says in Revelation 3.21, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So at the moment after Jesus overcame, what did he overcome? When he came at the first coming, and he died on the cross. The Bible says he overcame the darkness. He rose with power and might. And he took back the keys of death and hell from the enemy. And because he overcame at that point, he then sat down at the right hand of his father's throne. But when he comes back to the earth, he says to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. Jesus has a throne. So there are two thrones. There's the throne of God, the father, and then there's the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ as king of kings and as Messiah. And you will see that there are two tenses that are being used here. The past tense is that Jesus overcame in the past at the first coming. And then because he overcame there, he sat at, um, at the right hand of the throne of the father. Now, the future tense that is yet to happen at the second coming is that Jesus is going to come and sit on his throne. What is referring to as my throne. The throne that Jesus is coming to claim is the throne of David. If we go back all the way back um, to when Gabriel appeared to Mary um, before she would be pregnant with Jesus in Luke 1 verses 31 to 33, the, the, the angel of the Lord said to Mary, behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus, Savior. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end remember when we're looking at Matthew chapter 1 and we're looking at the gene genealogy and the coming of Christ you know we established that Jesus fits in under that lineage of David now, the Bible was clear here in Luke 1, 31 to 33, that Jesus has the throne of King David. Um, and we know that Father God promised David an eternal um, throne, an everlasting throne. So Jesus will come back and claim that throne and he will reign over the house of Jacob. In other words, he will reign over the Jewish nation and the people of Israel, and he will reign over the whole world. And the Bible says of his kingdom, there'll be no end. So once he ascends onto that throne, there won't be an end of that kingdom. Kingdom, that kingdom is eternal. So just to summarize it all, God's throne is not the throne of David. God's throne is in heaven. David's throne is on the earth. 
God's throne is from eternity, whereas David's throne was, was not established before the lifetime of David. God's throne is eternal by definition, but David's throne um, is, is temporal and it's almost like a placeholder so that the promise of God will come upon it and make it everlasting. We know that David's descendants sat on his throne, but they never sat on God's throne. So God refers to David's throne in the third person or as his throne or David's throne or the throne of David. So going back to um, verses 31 uh, to 36 that we read before, let's just read it again to refresh our minds on the sheep and the goats. It says, but when the son of man comes in his glory and majesty and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before Jesus for judgment and he will separate them from one another as a shepherd separates his sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right hand, which is the place of honor, and then he'll put the goats on his left, which is the place of rejection. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you blessed of my father, you favored of God, appointed to eternal salvation. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. You gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. You invited me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me with help and ministering care. I was in prison and you came to me ignoring personal danger. So let's talk about the sheep and the goats. So the sheep are those who are rewarded because they give aid to the brethren of the Lord. The goats are punished because they fail to give aid to the brethren of the Lord. Who are the brethren of the Lord? When the Lord says, you know, you did it um, if you did it to the least of my brethren, you did it to me. Who are the brethren of the Lord? So we know that the brethren of the Lord are distinct from both the sheep and the goats. Their condition is that they are either sick or they are in need of food, they are in need of drink, they are in need of clothing, they are in need of housing. They, are, they, they seem to be dispersed abroad or to be strangers or to be in prison. So every person who's going to be going through the period of the great tribulation and is going to be alive at the second coming of the Lord Jesus will fit into one of these three categories. Every person who is alive through the period of the great tribulation to the point of the second coming of the Lord Jesus will fit into one of these three headings. So the sheep are those who are Gentiles who have given their lives to Christ and are supportive of the Jewish nation who are going to go through um, a lot of challenging times with the great tribulation because you know there'll be a lot of focus on them the antichrist will focus you will focus his persecution on them the sheep are the gentile believers who are going to support the people of the lord the brethren of the lord the jewish people the goats are those who are going to practice anti-semitism who are going to refuse to give aid to the brethren of the lord the goats are the people who are going to re refuse to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, who are not going to be included in the kingdom. The brethren of the Lord are those people who are Jewish, who are going to be going through what we, you know, previously learned when we're studying the book of Revelation. When, when, when you go to Revelation 12 and you begin to see when the Bible describes the wonder that appears in the sky and there's the woman who's pregnant, who is being persecuted by the dragon and all that. We know that the Jewish people are going to face specific persecution during the great tribulation. They are the ones who are, are going to be in that condition where they're going to be needing help. They're going to be needing food, drink, clothing, housing. They'll be dispersed abroad or they will be in prisons. That's not to say Gentile believers won't have this as well. Gentile believers as well who refuse to renounce the Lord Jesus Christ during the great tribulation may find themselves also in similar conditions. They will find themselves in that place where they are also in need of food, they are in need of drink, they are in need of clothing, they are in need of housing, or where they are needing to flee their homes because the period of the great tribulation will see enhanced persecution. So, but what we know is that both the sheep and the brethren of the Lord will inherit the kingdom. The goats do not, they are judged. They are judged. So they are not going to be able to enter the kingdom of heaven. And I've put some references on uh, this slide 
you know, for you to go and, and do some further reading on your own regarding the identity of the brethren of the Lord and the identity of the sheep. So we will share the slides. If you would like a copy of them, just let me know. And you, you can go and um, read more about the identity of the sheep and the brethren of the Lord. Now, the brethren of the Lord and the sheep, they are going to um, following the judgment of the Lord, they will be rewarded and they will enter into um, the, the joy of the Lord. The commonality that the sheep and the brethren of the Lord have is that they are born again. These groups are born again. Only people who are born again can see the kingdom of God. There is no other um, qualification. It's the people who have given their lives to Christ, who are born again, they will see the kingdom. Remember when the Lord was speaking to Nicodemus, he says, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. That is the criteria, unless you are born again. That's what the Lord Jesus explained. The only difference between the sheep and the brethren of the Lord is their nationality. The sheep are Gentile believers from amongst the nations, whereas the brethren of the Lord are the Jewish believers. Um, H.A. Ironside observed that these are those of Israel who are related to Christ, both according to the flesh and according to the spirit, and will be his authoritative witnesses in the coming time of tribulation, when the present church age is ended. So remember, when we previously discussed the rupture, we said, the current age of the church that we are in right now, this unique body that was created on the day of Pentecost with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit indwelling us believers, you know, this current age of the church comes to an end um, at the rupture. And then we have a new dispensation up, up, up after that time. There's a, a different dispensation where we will see a lot of authoritative witnessing coming out of the Jewish nation. During that time of the great tribulation, a lot of Jewish people will be giving their lives to Christ. So this table is just to sort of um, summarize what is going on. So the brethren of the Lord on the left-hand side, we have a list of the brethren's problems. Um, so for example, the brethren might be lacking food and water during that time of the great tribulation. What is the reason? If you go to Revelation 13, 17, you realize that they are unable to buy or sell without the mark of the beast. And so the sheep who are the Gentile believers will respond by providing them with the food and the drink. The brethren's problems might be that they've become strangers because they have to, to run away. They have to escape uh, from their home uh, place. And you will see that again, we saw it in Matthew 24, 15. And in Revelation 12, 13, you see that the, the, the woman um, is, 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 is given a place to go and hide. The nation Israel is given a place to go and hide during that great tribulation for three and a half years. So in that flight, they will need places to, um, to stay in. So this is just a, um, a chart summarizing some of those eventualities and why that comes to pass. Why are they naked? Why are they sick? Why are they in prison? It is because of the, um, the evil policies that would have been instituted by the Antichrist and um, the false prophet and the whole satanic machinery at, at that time. So now, again, putting both Matthew 24 and 25, what, what, what have we learned? What have we learned, you know, about the end time? We see that now, the problems and the dangers that have characterized human history, you know, including World War I, World War II, all that, some of the things which we've thought have been, you know, extremely awful and extremely horrific and, and terrible, actually, all those things will be eclipsed by the Great Tribulation, which will take place immediately prior to the Second Coming. So some people will say, look, um, we are already in tribulation, but that's not true because we've not yet seen, you know, the level of the persecution that the Bible describes. And at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be a separation, you know, of the goats and the sheep in preparation for a time of blessing for the messianic, um, you know, 
1000 year reign, the, the, the millennium reign of Christ. So we've previously explained when we're studying the book of Revelation that the millennium reign was not the year 2000. You know, the millennium reign is when the Lord Jesus comes to take that throne of his father, David, and we see judgment that removes the goats and we begin to see justice and peace because the throne of the Lord Jesus is a throne of righteousness. It's a throne of peace. It's a throne of uh, the, the manifestations of the personality and the character of God. Um, though people who don't have a relationship with Christ will be removed, you know, during that judgment. So now, given the Jewish aspects that will be revealed um, at the time of the great tribulation, where do we stand? You know, uh, uh, if for any reason the persecutions were to come to pass today, you know, where would you be found? Would you be amongst the goats? Or would you be amongst the sheep? Would you be willing, um, you know, to suffer persecution to stand on the Lord's side? Would you be willing to go through whatever else that people are going to go through for standing on the Lord's side and supporting his brethren? When the people of God, one thing we are seeing here, you know, with the parable of the, of the, the 10 uh, virgins that we started off with and the parable of the talents. And now this section on the judgments, what we see is that when we neglect the word of God, we become unaware of what is going on and the will of God. And you start to oppose the work of God. So for example, anti-Semitism in any shape or form should not be found amongst any Christians. Because the Bible speaks specifically about these issues. You know, the Bible says in James 2, 14 to 17, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and be filled. I wish you um, to be full. I, I wish that you would have all the nice food that you want to eat. I wish you an a la carte menu. I just wish you all the food. You know, like one of our former pastors used to pray. He would say, I pray for you that you will eat what you like and not what you see. So let's say you pray for them and say, you're going to eat what you like and not what you see. You're going to eat just exactly what you wish to eat. But then you actually don't buy them food. The Bible says, if you just say to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? What's the use of all that? He says, that's also faith by itself. If it does not have works is dead. And now this is very applicable to the end time and even going on to those days of the great tribulation. Anyone on earth who says they have faith, their faith has to be demonstrated by the works that they do. Now, during the great tribulation, one of the outworkings of faith will be to stand with the Jewish nation. One of the outworkings of faith will be to stand with the brethren of the Lord, will be to stand and be on the Lord's side and support the people of God who are going through persecution and harassment. Now, for us right now, we are not in the great tribulation. One of the marks of your faith is that when brethren need practical help, you are there to provide that help. You don't stand back and shy away from giving help. You don't spend all your life praying for them to be blessed, but never actually practically do anything. So as we round up this chapter tonight, um, I wanted to pose some reflection uh, questions for us. You know, are we truly amongst his servants uh, or are we just involved in religious activities that make us look like servants? Do we view God primarily through the lens of fear or is our fear and respect for the Lord balanced with love, joy and gratitude? If all you do is that you're afraid of going to hell, um, then that's not really the spirit of the Holy Spirit. You know, when we have Holy Spirit in us, we honor God, we reverence him, and we walk in his love, we walk in his joy, we walk in his gratitude. We don't live our lives in fear because the Bible says perfect love casts out fear for where there is fear, there is torment. But when you have the love of God inside of you, when you have a relationship with God, you don't live a life of fear. You know, do we know God? Are we confident that we know him and he knows us, that we've been born of the spirit? Is our Christian walk actually characterized by disobedience and laziness? Or 
are we those people who can say, you know what, every time I go, I look into the scriptures and the scriptures are saying a particular thing, I surrender to God and allow his grace to lead me in the path where he wants me to go. Am I consistently disobedient to God? Am I consistently lazy about doing the things of God? If I'm that way, then I need to come back to the altar and surrender my life to Christ, you know, do you find yourself ignoring biblical teachings or some people even get angry when the Bible is being read, they take it personally rather than actually receiving it and repenting and asking the Lord to help. You know, when, when we fail, is our first response to rationalize our actions or are we quick to repent and allow the Holy Spirit to get us back on track? You know, if when you fail, all you do is you say, you know what, I'm only human and all this, and you made me do this, or you made me do that. Or if he didn't do this, I wouldn't have done this. If we rationalize our actions, then it means we never actually repent. But these Bible passages that we've been reading from Matthew 24 to 25 is really um, emphasizing the end times and the judgment that is to come. In. You know, that that is to come. The Bible says, you know, a time is coming when judgment will start first in the house of the Lord. It says that if you don't want to be judged, judge yourself. You know, it says, know ye not, you know, whether the spirit of Jesus is inside of you or not. In other words, you and I have the capacity to tell whether we are walking in the Lord or we are doing our own thing. And if we're doing our own thing, this is again another reminder for us all to come to the place of repentance and allow the Holy Spirit to put us back on track. So in summary, Matthew 24 and 25 contain a series of warnings about being unprepared for the return of Christ at the end of the age. So his second coming. And the Bible says, you know, in the previous chapter we read in Matthew 24, 37 to 44, that the coming of Christ will be just like as in the days of Noah. In other words, people will be getting married, they'll be having wedding ceremonies, they'll be buying and selling, they'll be doing business. It will not look like anything out of the ordinary is about to happen. And if you are distracted and you're not watching, judgment will come and find you unprepared. So we mustn't think, you know, that I'm going to wake up one day and there'll be a sign in the sky that Jesus is coming today, then I'll quickly clean up my act. No, it must be that we're perpetually ready. We also read about faithfulness, you know, stewardship. We saw it in Matthew 24, but also we saw it with the parable of the talents in this very chapter, that when we become unprofitable servants, it means that, you know, you can find yourself in outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And obviously that's a description of hell. May God forbid that for us, that after all our Bible studies, after all the church activity, you then find yourself in hell. May God forbid that for us. Again, with the parable of the wise and foolish virgins, we see that it's important to have a relationship with God. It's important not just to do activities for God, but to have a relationship. Because if you don't have a relationship, according to Matthew 25, 1 to 13, the Lord will come and say, I do not know you and you will be shut out. And at that point, there is no appeal. It's not like earthly courts where you're going to appeal and say, no, I don't agree with the decision of the king. The decision of the king is final. So this is a prompt for us to get to know the Lord right here and right now. In each case, individuals or groups which appear outwardly similar in the parables we read in this chapter, you see that on the outside, people might appear similar but actually their destiny is radically different. So in the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins, on the outside, they were all virgins. They all were looking like they were waiting for the bridegroom. But you know what? On the inside of them, five were not born again. Five ended up in hell. Parable of the talents. Outwardly, they all looked like the servants of the Lord. But you know what? There was one who ended up going to hell. And so the, the message here is not about us trying to measure other people, trying to see whether other people are going to go to heaven. It's about us evaluating ourselves and asking the Holy Spirit to help us so that you are assured beyond a shadow of doubt that you are in step and in alignment with the will of God. And whatever we are doing is something that the Lord wants us to be doing and is something for which we will get an eternal good reward. External appearances and external performance is an unreliable indication as to one's ultimate standing with God. You know, externally, 
you might be considered a wonderful evangelist. Externally, you might look like you are a great archbishop or pastor or whatever, but that's not what the Lord will be looking at. So the warning here is to each and every one of us to look in what and to consider, are we part of the wise virgins or are we part of the foolish? Are we with the sheep or are we with the goats? And there's a motivation for us to make our election and our calling sure. As we close tonight, I want to read for us First Peter, First Peter chapter 1, um, verse 10. It's quite a really good passage to read um, for us to, to understand that giving our lives to Christ is not just um it's not just the end of it once we've given our lives to Christ what then are we going to do with it what then are we going to do with it the bible says we must make sure that we are ready in first peter 1:10 the bible says this salvation i'm reading new living translation this salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. So what we have right now in this age is a huge gift that God has blessed us with. And we ought to live our lives every day in recognition of that gift, with that revelation, with that thanksgiving, that we've been given a great gift and make sure we are motivated to make our election and our calling sure. In other words, Jesus has already died. He has given us the basics. Now, as his followers, what are we going to do? Every day we must live our lives by his grace and by his will. When we fail, when we make mistakes, which is natural for humans, we mustn't delay repentance. We must go back to the cross. We must go back to the blood, renounce and reject our sins and receive the grace to move forward. I pray that the Lord will help us and that this... Um, Chapter Matthew 25 will not stand against us on the day of judgment. It will not be that we heard this and we ignored it. But I pray that the Lord will give me and give each of you, brethren, that grace to become a doer of the word. Amen. I'm going to stop here tonight. Um, I don't know if anybody has anything to add on before we pray. <laughs>